I think this is a new frontier. I think uh, um, historically we have been crossing multiple frontiers. Uh, coming out of Africa was a big leap. Uh, you know, flying was a big leap. Going around the world was a big leap. Of course, uh, the, f the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, I was named after him. That was an enormous development. 55 years ago today. 55 years ago today. And um, I think uh, every generation needs to have this uh, leap uh, ahead of them. And I think going to the stars was uh, dreamed, dreamed of for so long by so many uh, that uh, it is really incredible that we can announce this project today in the 21st century based on the developments that happen in technology just in the last 15 years. Yuri, what do you hope to find with this project? Extraterrestrial life, planets that humans could inhabit at some point in the distant future? Well, uh, we will know much more about the planets uh, in the nearby uh, systems, uh, stellar systems, before we launch. So I don't think we're going to fly blind. Uh, but at the same time, we uh, might discover something unexpected. So it's unlikely that there is an intelligent civilization in the near vicinity of the sun. But it is likely that there is a planet in a habitable zone. And of course, that would be amazing to fly by one of those planets and uh, send images back to the back to our planet. Images. Images. Those are some expensive pictures. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's expensive, but also exciting. I think uh, someone might just pay a lot for that one picture. Even if the technology works as envisioned, it's going to take a generation before this project even gets off the ground. It's going to take 20 years for these miniature spacecraft to get to Alpha Centauri, and then years more before those images are beamed back to Earth. Four years. Will you be here to see it? Well, that uh, uh, I, I don't know. Um, some of the other developments in uh, the area of life, sci life sciences might uh, make it easier <laughs> to see that happening. But, uh, uh, but I think uh, the most important thing is that we push this uh, thing forward, and if need be, we can pass this baton to the next generation so that they will reap the results of it. But I think uh, we don't remember that uh, as much, but the, the cathedrals were built by many generations. Uh, and. Uh, um, and I think that this is the kind of project that will take uh, a lot of efforts. Uh, we have a lot of technical challenges, but uh, the challenges are not insurmountable, and uh, there is no uh, there is no scientific challenges uh, uh, anymore. What do you say, Yuri, to people who listen to what you're saying to me? who look at the presentation you've made today and maybe even give it a little bit of thought and say, is he kind of crazy? Because this is pretty out there. What do you say to those people? Well, I was very skeptical myself, even, uh, even uh, a year ago. Um, you know, my background, background is science, and um, I was the first to try to punch a lot of holes in this project. Uh, we had a small team of uh, scientists and engineers working on this, but, uh, but it is really incredible that only now, in 2015 or 16, we can, ha we, we can announce this. If we would be sitting here in these chairs um, 10, 15 years ago, uh, it this, would have seemed crazy. It, it then. would have seen. It, it would. It would have been irresponsible to make to make this <laughs> announcement and to put a hundred million dollars behind. But it. I think that now we can uh, we can actually make this first step and do the feasibility study, which will uh, hopefully uh, give us the blueprint for the next steps forward. A year ago, you were trying to, in your words, punch holes into this idea. How did you get involved? Was this something you wanted to do? Did somebody approach you? Well, I had this uh, childhood dream, like many other boys, especially the ones called Yuri's, to, uh, 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 um, do, to do something and to make a contribution to this project. 
and uh, and I'm I think I'm very fortunate that I can now uh, devote some of the resources. So this uh, isn't an investment. This no, is not. This is, can it make money? Should it even make money? This is a non-profit initiative. And by the way, I'm very happy to uh, to announce that Mark Zuckerberg have joined the board of this foundation alongside Stephen Hawking, and. Uh, his support was uh, was really incredibly important, um, and his endorsement. So, so I think that as we will pass this most risky phase of, of this project, when this hundred million will be spent on research and development, I think at that point we would be hopefully able to come out and say that yes, indeed, this project can be done in certain time frame. But we uh, uh, we truly believe now that it is time to, uh, to launch this project and to make sure that we explore the real possibility of interstellar travel. Is he contributing some of that $100 million, or is he contributing, is any financial contribution he's making over and above the $100 million? Not at this point, but I think his, uh, his moral support and endorsement is, uh, is very important. Who else might you get now, some money from? Now, this project from? might require much more funding in the future. Well, clearly, the total cost is, has got to be in the billions of dollars. Yes, that's correct. So, so how do you, where do you raise that kind of money? NASA is tapped out. The total cost is comparable to the largest science uh, projects that we have funded so far. And I think the closest example might be uh, the large uh, Hadron Collider in Geneva, CERN. the CERN. Um, and I think uh, it should be a similar collaborative effort uh, that brings uh, together people from around the world to make well, it happen. Can you bring together just Western countries and organizations, or do you think you can, being Russian, can you get the Russians involved? Can you get the Chinese involved? This project cannot be done by one country. It has to be global as uh, almost by definition it represents all of us. If we launch something so far, so fast, uh, fast moving, we need to create some sort of consensus on our planet that this is the right thing to do. There are also policy issues that we, uh, we need to uh, pay attention to here. Uh, so it's a combination of technology and policy that we would need to solve uh, in the next 20, 30 years. You need to find donors of significant means like yourself and Mark Zuckerberg. Have you been successful yet? Uh, for this project? Yes. Well, this project is uh, I'm finding myself for the time being. But again... But to realize the, the, the ambition. The next phase of the project would require additional funding. Um, and again, as I said, it will have to be a global effort. Um, uh, as global as uh, some of the major scientific efforts we have done in the last few years. Now, this isn't your first effort in space. Uh, you're already funding radio telescopes, and you invested in SpaceX as well, right? Uh, yes, I've, uh, I've made the investment in SpaceX uh, uh, um, a, few, a few years ago. But uh, uh, this project is uh, uh, following the project that was announced also with Stephen Hawking a year mm -hmm. ago to look for intelligent life in the universe. Let me ask you this question, Yuri. You're doing this. This is a philanthropic effort. But Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos want to take tourists into space. Elon Musk, who is behind SpaceX, also wants to colonize Mars. Is it right, in your mind, that space is kind of becoming a playground for billionaires? Well, um, I honestly believe uh, from the historic perspective it's not going to matter. Because uh, uh, nobody remembers right now who funded Columbus' uh, expedition. Was it the government funding? Was it a combination of private donors? Was it a public funding of sorts at the time. What we do remember is uh, the result. That he landed so in I San think, Salvador. So I think all those uh, uh, details and nuances on uh, who is funding what at this point uh, will not matter in the next uh, few hundred or thousand years. Yuri, you're, you, know, you made your fortune as an investor. People know you for investing in Facebook, for, in Twitter, for example. You're out of those positions. You've been selling down your position in Alibaba and in JD.com. Is this how you're redeploying your capital, or are you 
redeploying it as an investor in other ways? Well, obviously, my day job is uh, DST. Uh, this is my hobby. This is very uh, important <laughs> for me to say. So 80% of my time I'm spending on uh, investments, and 20% uh, of my time is dedicated to projects like this. Uh, so that's pretty much how capital is allocated. Now, so let's talk about the day job for just a moment, the 80% of your time that you're dedicating towards DST. What interests you right now? What are you investing in? Because I can see that you're captivated by ideas of tremendous promise. So this is what you're doing as a hobby, for example. But how about in the real world? Well, in the real world, I think that uh, the technological revolution is unstoppable. I think innovation uh, has been happening for so long that we don't have any reason to believe that it's going to stop. So essentially what we do is invest in innovation. And every generation brings their contribution to innovation. And if history is of any lesson, every generation is building their own companies, you know, like Facebook, like Alibaba, like uh, Spotify. Uh, you would believe that innovation will be dominated by big companies, big mature old companies. And, uh, and the, the answer is no. Every generation is building their own companies. So innovation may be unstoppable, but you have to make some careful and one would hope intelligent choices about whom to invest with and what technology. So what appeals to you right now? Well, we, we continue to believe that um, internet and mobile uh, innovation is the space we should uh, stay in. I was very fortunate to, uh, uh, to be in Korea when uh, there was this uh, AlphaGo match between uh, 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 DeepMind and Google and, uh, and a human being. And I was uh, absolutely fascinated by uh, just observing very closely how this uh, competition was taking place. And my biggest, my biggest uh, eye-opening experience was that uh, the humans who build this machine, they, uh, they really did not know why the machine is making certain moves. So here's another big trend for you, artificial intelligence. Uh, and this is something that uh, we, uh, we should be investing in. Four years ago, you told me that you would continue to be invested with the founders of the companies in which you held stakes so long as they continued to push the envelope. Yet you're out of Facebook. Do you have any regrets about that? Well, uh, this is really how private equity business works. You have to recycle the capital. Yes, the, uh, our funds have certain lifetime and we have to return capital to investors. If you could be, would you still be invested in Facebook? Yes. You would be. Yes. How about Twitter? Um, I, uh, you know, we, we do evaluate projects <laughs> and companies uh, sort of regularly. Um, I, um, as, as we are uh, out of some of the positions, I don't follow them very closely. Right. Um, you know the reason I asked that question, though. It's because Facebook, right, has a billion, you know, 1.6 billion users. And people are questioning whether a company like Twitter is still relevant. Um, I think Twitter is relevant. I think Twitter is, uh, is a global project. If you, try to, if you try to list all projects, all Internet companies with global audience, there will be probably less than 10 and Twitter is one of them. So I think uh, Twitter has, uh, uh, has its uh, followers and it's an uh, enormously important company um, as a way to um, disseminate information like we have been using Twitter today to make this announcement. So I think Twitter will continue to be a very important company. Several of your most recent investments are in China. I mentioned JD.com, there's Xiaomi and several others, and you've also been prospecting and investing in India. Would you ever consider relocating there to be closer to what you're doing? To India or to China? Or to China, yes. Well, I, um, I have been traveling in the last few years about 200 days a year, 
and uh, I have been visiting and I am still visiting China a few times a year as well as India. Um, 40 percent of our capital was invested in China, 40 percent in U.S. and 20 percent in India and Europe. And that's pretty much how I spend my time. I'm trying to. So 40 percent of the capital deployed. Yes. But some of that capital is, has appreciated yes. at a faster rate in China. Xiaomi, for example, comes to mind. Right. A lot of people spend far too much of their time wondering when Uber is going to go public. Should they instead be wondering when Xiaomi is going to go public? I don't know. This is uh, always a uh, founder's decision. Uh, I think what is really important is to have multiple financing sources available. So when we started to invest six years ago in so-called late-stage uh, internet, that was uh, something that was not very popular. I think right now there is this whole space uh, and there are many funds who participate in funding companies at late stage, which creates an alternative for them uh, to go public. So I think as long as all those alternatives are available for the founders, they will be making this ultimate decision. Well, as, as you know, private funding has uh, proven to be perhaps a little bit disappointing, these fallen unicorns, if you will. Um, Yuri, one quick question before we wrap. Does Silicon Valley still have the power to innovate? Of course. Uh, if you look at the last uh, 15 years, um, you know, the biggest companies in the world have been created in Silicon Valley. And uh, it's an incredible place uh, in terms of uh, innovation, in terms of influence, in terms of uh, uh, amount of capital, but especially intellectual capital. So it's really the, uh, uh, the intellectual uh, capital of the world, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So it's uh, the concentration of smart people per square mile is unprecedented.